it simply wasn't doable. Um, one person by myself. Segment four. You decide that you really have no other viable option than to explain the situation to the therapist and let him determine whether or not to proceed under the circumstances. Again, interrupting the segment here, I just don't know that I could leave that in the therapist's hands. He tells you that it's a critical juncture in the deaf person's therapeutic program and insists the session go on as scheduled. During the session, you struggle a few times, particularly at some of the graphic fantasies described by a couple of the members of the group. Nevertheless, you leave the session feeling that under the circumstances, the deaf person was not disadvantaged and apart from your own uneasiness at working in such a session alone, field session was generally quite successful. However, you begin to realize that this ongoing assignment is beginning to affect you emotionally. You're definitely not looking forward to the group session next week, especially after the graphic descriptions you interpreted this week. What would you do and why? Um, I would have to excuse myself from the assignment. Um, I would have to contact the mental health clinic and recommend that they find a replacement interpreter and strongly recommend that um, that they not proceed with sessions in the future if a team of interpreters is not available. Um, I would also recommend that the nature of the assignment be included before an interpreter was hired because it is such a sensitive situation. Um, some interpreters, myself included, might not be emotionally um, equipped to interpret in such settings and um, I would have to I, I would have to get out of the, uh, the situation. Um, hmm. Yeah, very disturbing. Okay. Segment five. A few days later, a friend of yours asks you to interpret for a Cub Scout den meeting. Your friend's deaf son and another deaf boy belong to the Cub Scout den based at the local school they attend. However, they want to attend the upcoming regional scouting camporee, a scouting Olympics, that will take place over an upcoming long holiday weekend. You've been asked to interpret the organizational meeting, and because it is your friend, you agree to do so on a pro bono basis. When you arrive, there are approximately 50 Cub Scouts and their parents, mostly fathers, at the meeting. As you're waiting for your friend and his son to arrive, you notice one of the men there looks familiar. After a short time, you realize he's one of the men from the group counseling session. You remember him quite clearly because of the graphic descriptions of his sexual fantasies, almost all of which involved young boys. What would you do? Wow. Um, sheesh. Um, most probably, I would interpret as I had been asked to do. Um, this to me, you know, comes down to a question of my morals and the, the code of ethics being in conflict. Um, of course, if a friend of mine's son I feel is in danger, um, the instinctual thing to do is going to be to try and protect the boy. However, um, the code of ethics is clear about confidentiality and, you know, the, the, the do no harm, um, uh, you know, if someone's going to be a harm to themselves or to themselves or others, I have no right to judge that this person is indeed a threat. They're in therapy, court ordered, but they're in therapy. And, um, you know, no matter how uncomfortable I am with this person's fantasies, that's part of the therapeutic process for them to get them out. Um, so that I don't, I don't feel that ethically I have a leg to stand on in terms of, you know, warning the, the friend. Um, I personally tend to be able to shut out um, emotional things like that while I'm working afterward. I might have to seek some type of counseling or um, 
ad- advice, you know, vicarious trauma, trauma type counseling, um, because of my concerns for the boys. But again, um, I have no right to interfere with the, the person's therapy and the repercussions for everybody involved um, would be too great for me to chance that. Segment six. Finally, your friend and his son arrive, and after a few minutes, the meeting starts. The leader, after reviewing the tentative schedule, then asks for volunteers for various tasks, including driving, overnight supervisors, and competition judging. As fathers begin to volunteer for the various tasks, the man you recognize from the counseling session volunteers to drive and be one of two overnight supervisors. The leader thanks him and then announces that no more volunteers are needed. What would you do and why? I think as I stated previously, I would have to keep my mouth shut. Um, I don't know what's going on between this person and his counselor. Um, I can't know his heart no matter how bothered I am by his graphic fantasies, um, hmm. I, I, I couldn't say anything. Um, I think Tamara mentioned in one of her posts, you know, that one of the parts of her ethical decision-making process is, can you live with it? And I think I would be equally equally um, troubled or equally um, whatever the word. I couldn't live with e- with either choice. I mean, I, if I outed the man, um, violated the code of ethics and confidentiality, um, that would be almost as bad as um, if I said nothing and it happened that he was um, turned out to, to abuse um, the children. So again, um, wow. I think I'm, again, this is why I don't take mental health interpreting setting, uh, mental, mental health interpreting assignments. Um, I know that horrible things like this happen in the world and I am content to just not be aware of them. Um, Yeah, I totally feel icky now, and um, I'm going to close this out. This was um, (laughs) quite an interesting experience. Um, I don't put myself in situations like this because I don't want to think about them, so having to think about it was probably good for me um, in terms of growing my ethical decision-making part of my brain, um, but I'm going to go take a shower.